Welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. My name is Connie Knox. I am your host here today, but this is a three-part series on how to use geneticaffairs.com so that you can cluster your DNA cousin matches. Now, this is part two of the series. In this episode, we are talking about targeted clustering with the founder of Genetic Affairs, E.J. Blom. Let's pick up where we left off in part one right now. So in previous analysis, uh, the previous presentation, so you're not always interested in a complete clustering. So for instance, this is a graphical representation of your own, of my tree, of a tree. And I have now visually depicted the matches that are linked to my common ancestors and also the, the clusters. And as you can see, the upper side of my of this particular tree is pretty gray. So that means that there are almost no matches linked to my paternal side of the um, family tree. Whereas of the maternal side of my tree, I have lots of people met linked. So, I, so you can imagine that in this case, if you have an unknown father, that you would like to focus on your father's side because the stuff on your mother's side, the ancestors on your mother's side, these matches you have already linked, uh, but now it's too, not time to move on and to uh, find out about the other side. Or if you are, for instance, only interested in a very specific brands of your family tree, so a very thick uh, set of matches that you would like to investigate. So we decided to have a, a certain rule-based clustering approach for this uh, for, uh, available, which actually makes use of three rules. And this, this employs the profiles that are linked to your account. So it actually it is, is, for instance, useful for all of your family tree DNA uh, accounts, uh, profiles, your 23 me profiles. So let's go through the rules. So every run that you do has this very nice graphical interface and shows you the different scenarios. And this is also on the website. So this explains when and why you should use certain rules. So we have the not rule, which is the first rule, which can be used to exclude certain matches. So you can imagine that if you have tested yourself and your mother and you're not interested in your mother's matches because you would like to find out about your father's side, you can use the not rule to remove all of your mother's matches. And that then leaves out all of your mother's matches and that, uh, so you're stuck with uh, the matches of your father's side, which uh, provides a much more clear analysis. So the clusters that, well, that arise from this analysis are all, are all on your father's side. There's also an AND rule, and this rule allows you to look for overlap. So if you have a half-sister and you would like to find out about the shared parent that you have with your half-sister, for instance, a uh, father in this case, you can do the AND rule, and this will look at the matches of the half-sister and then only take into account the matches that you share with her and then do the clustering of these matches. And that also will provide only the clusters that will be contained within these matches. And the last rule is an OR rule, which you can use to combine matches. So for instance, if you have several siblings and you didn't test the, the parents by testing all of the different siblings, you can now capture all of the matches that uh, they have uniquely uh, present for their profile. So you can imagine that certain matches are present in your in your sister's uh, DNA match list, which are not present in yours, or vice versa. And by combining everything, uh, you will have a much more uh, complete picture. So I have a visualization of this or, or rule, so this combination rule. So this is a rule-based clustering. So you can also make different rules. So you can use different rules to make specific combinations. And this uh, example, this is a sibling clustering that the, all of the additional matches that you obtain from your siblings are indicated with the plus symbol. So the ones that are extra. So you see some clusters that were not originally in your match list. So the brown one and the pink one. And also some of the gray, gray uh, cluster were also not in your original list. So these were all obtained from your, from your brothers and sisters if you uh, this or clustering. And also, for instance, if you would match 100 cm marker with a specific match and your brother would match 150, it will take the highest cm marker. So you would see the 150 back in this analysis because it, does, it makes sense to take the highest. That's interesting. That's good to know, actually. Yeah. Another thing that was, what, that was requested when I uh, first went to um, Rootstack was a lady that was very interested in her Irish matches and she had starved 
all of her suspected iris matches on Ancestry, and she wanted me to know if I could do the analysis only on the start matches. And after a while, I caved in and I uh, created the uh, feature. And so you had a f an option to only take into account the start matches. So it actually takes all of the matches from Ancestry and I will come back into uh, features from Family Tree DNA and that me. And it would look for clusters within those matches that were star. So you can see now there are different st st cluster structures within this match. And these were done um, found back later. Yeah, so we were inspired by the Ancestry shared matches. I was first notified, um, asked by somebody on RootStack, a lady that was um, the, analyzing her iris matches and she had stored all of her iris matches on Ancestry and she was interested in uh, getting the clusters within those start matches. Well, let me so, ask you real quick. Mm -hmm. Can we download <laughs> the raw data? No, that's not going to work, right? We can't yeah. download the raw data from Ancestry and upload it to you, can we? Unfortunately, yeah. So, so the real raw data is, of course, the DNA results, but that's not useful for the clustering. Okay. But they, but they don't provide a way to get the uh, match list or shared match data quickly. No, that's all manual labor. So, Got it. Yeah, that's really a lot of work. And it used to be um, very efficient using my tool. And now it's really back to uh, tears, sweat, and um, lots of pain. Uh, I, I hear you. All right, thank you. Anyways, but back in the days when it was still possible, we were doing the uh, very cool things with the uh, data provided by NSAS. We like, for instance, the stat, shot, the stat match, matches, and we uh, were able to find clusters in those, of course, because if you uh, start uh, enough members, then you are able to find uh, some structures in that. And later on, they introduced the ancestry groups. So they had the groups on ancestry. So you could put matches into a group and you could only focus the analysis on a certain group, which was also very nice. So the cool thing was that it also, we also implemented some options to um, discard groups so you could remove matches from, from the analysis that are in the group. So basically a not rule. So if you put in your mom or your dad in a, in a certain group, you could tell the tool to discard everybody in that group and it would remove that person. So that made it very, uh, very uh, interesting. And I will come back to this um, group feature uh, later, but we, first I will show you how we implemented something similar to family tree DNA and 23 me. So now we're getting back to this box, uh, Connie, that, you, that you've uh, noticed at the beginning already. So, by, so we implemented a similar system for family tree DNA and 23 me, but I don't have the, the nice grouping option like Ancestry does. So, but instead we use the identifiers that are linked to the family tree DNA and 23, 23, 23 me, me matches. So if you open an Excel file from an other cluster analysis, you will find some unique codes for every match. And by putting those codes in here, you can do an analysis only for the matches that you have selected. But of course, that's a lot of work. Uh, we have a trick to make it a little bit easier. Like I said, these were in an Excel and in, in, in the uh, these are available in the Excel file. But for instance, you could be interested in a targeting clustering for a single match or several matches. For instance, your newly discovered second cousin. So imagine getting an email from our website telling you you have a 300 centimorgan match. Uh, and you're, of course, very interested how this particular match and this only this match is then clustering with your matches. And I think somebody on the website, on the members page of our Facebook group, came up with a... Um, a came up with a... Um, um, a method to get this um, uh, more quickly and we call it extend clusters. This extend cluster option allows you to take one or several matches as a starting point. So for instance, for instance you have a single high centimorgan match. So this match in the, which is now reflected uh, as one. This particular match has shared matches. Um, what, what we then do about this extend cluster feature is that we retrieve shared matches for those shared matches. So we have one match which shares six shared matches. We then take the shared matches for this match, for this match, for this match, for this match. This Interesting. Match, this match. And now we use all of those 26 matches for clustering. And if you do this for a second cousin, you will get a lot of matches contained in this um, clustering in, so within this uh, method. Uh, I have here an example 
with a very so this is based on this procedure using a single high centimorgan match and you can see that there are many clusters that are contained in the shared match section of this particular high centimorgan match and this is all linked to this particular high centimorgan match so you're automatically only looking at very relevant clusters that are only linked to your um, high centimorgan match and if you look closely in the top you can see that the that the top row is completely gray because that's the single so, so that's the match that i just just described which is actually linking to every one of those matches and that's why it's gray so you can see that this um there are some very interesting structures underneath and this is a a, a feature that could be used much more much more often because you have now a very specific analysis and this allows you to weed out the ones that you are not interested in so um, a very um, very good analysis the opposite is also possible so you can also delete matches so if you put a single exclamation mark you will remove a certain match from the analysis if you put two exclamation marks it will remove the match and it shares matches so imagine the example that i just provided about the single high centimorgan match if you would like to remove this match and the shared matches you could put in two exclamation marks and it will do completely the opposite so it will keep all of the other matches but it will remove all of the matches that are shared with your high centimorgan match so you can discard a complete family branch of your of your uh, analysis so it's up to you so you can do all those tricks to do the uh, analysis or so doing a more targeted approach to, to, to so to wrap up this particular analysis so we have rule based versus match based so we started out with rule based which needs access to the profile so to be able to do the rule based analysis you need access to the dna matches the nice thing about rule based is that you can do a combined rule so the or rule whereas if you do a match based clustering so using the identifiers you can use the shared matches from your own match list so you don't need to have access to these dna matches you can just take a certain cousin take the identifier and use that to uh, look into this cousin and find more specific uh, clusters from based on this shared uh, match list of this cousin. and you can do the analysis uh, based upon these matches um so that's the um that's the rule-based and the match-based uh, clustering. It's now time to do some more follow-up analysis. Like if you have your clusters, what are you doing then going to do? And typically people are going to analyze the trees of their matches to identify common ancestors or reconstruct a tree, right? So we automated this uh, process and we actually, we uh, employ three steps. These are three steps to get the, uh, get the results, which are actually quite logical. So first, if you have the trees, we take all the persons with from, these, uh, from, from the trees and we look at the surnames. So we cluster everybody based on their surname. So all the Jones go together with the Jones and the Smiths with the Smiths. But of course, there are some people in there that have, don't have the same first name. So that's the second step. We do a first name clustering, which then brings together all of the people based on their first name and their surnames because we do the clustering based on the surname cluster. So we take the Jones and then we do the clustering based on the first names. So we get automatically keep all the Jones and then we get the clusters with the first names as well. So we get smaller clusters. And then at last, we take the birth death years and we take those into account to do the clustering. So we end up with people that have a similar first name, a similar surname and approximately, or maybe the same birth and death years. Fantastic. That is very smart. Yeah. Uh, this is now available for family tree DNA and it will be available for jet mats in the uh, upcoming uh, weeks, months. Uh, as you might have uh, thought, this was also available for ancestry where it worked brilliantly because the trees on ancestry were such high quality and so abundant that it worked really nicely there. So all of the, uh, um, Examples that I will show you are based on uh, ancestry trees because these were so much better. But in principle, you get the, you could get those results for family tree DNA. You just have to be a little bit more lucky. So this is how it looks. This is actually a reconstructed tree. So in the top section, you see a title with the common ancestors in the title, and which is then represented. So this is a maybe you yeah, you recognize the style. This is based on the uh, Wado. Uh, a tree building tool. Do you, do you uh, recognize it? Yeah, you're so going to need to explain to the audience the Wado. Yeah, the Wado is a, a tool to, to test different hypotheses. Um, I think you have a YouTube um, about this Wado uh, from DNA Painter, right? Uh, I've mentioned it 
a, a couple times, but yeah, uh, I don't a, have one specifically for the water tool, no. It's a very nice tool that allows you to test several different trees and how, you, how people are placed in that particular tree. Um, and the, the type of uh, visualization is now also reused by the auto trees. So for those here, who are not familiar with what the water tool is, though, it's what are the odds? Yes, that's the one. The particular common ancestor is now placed at the left. So this is John Shamwell Freeman. And you can see at the complete right, these are DNA matches that are linked to this particular common ancestor. And some have different common ancestors as well. So this particular this section, these people here, they have a grandfather, grandmother set that are shared. And the colors that I used I reflect the amount of shared sedum organ. See the ones that are more purple, mm -hmm. share much more. And in this example, I've also placed, I had a, I, I, I had my tree linked to this example as well. So this person was also placed in a tree. And this is the green one. So this is yourself. This is your mother. This is your grandfather. So this allows you to see yourself in the tree with all of your DNA matches based on their trees. Now this is uh, this is your auto tree, right? This isn't from. Well, this is actually paper? from somebody from the, uh, the USA. This is actually the adoptee that I was mentioning um, in the beginning slide, right? So I was working a lot with his data, uh, and he was half Dutch, half uh, U.S. So he had very nice U.S. roots, uh, so very high centimorgan matches, so very good reconstructed trees. Um, so I use uh, so I use his data for uh, for these. Uh, uh, testing purposes. Uh, maybe it's worth noting that in orange yellow here, do, do you see this one? This is from Thurton Reese and then yes. it goes down to, this is an unlinked tree from Ancestry. So I was also mining the unlinked trees because not everybody on Ancestry linked their tree to their profile. And so sometimes uh, these are actually valid trees, but uh, these are just not linked properly. And by mining those unlinked trees, you could really nicely uh, get some really good clues. So this is available for um, Family tree DNA and ZMatch. Well, another thing that we did was we looked for common locations. So you can imagine that there are some ancestors that have matches, as uh, ancestors linked to DNA matches that have um, common locations. Uh, so we used, so we look at the uh, the birth locations of the, of three persons of DNA matches, and then we look for commonality. So the same uh, uh, birth locations. Uh, so we make big tables. And we show those tables for the to the user, and we actually we integrate the common ancestors. We come we integrate those in the auto cluster tool as well. So if you look at the auto cluster tool and you see those green Christmas trees, so the, and here they are not green, but they are nowadays green. You know that there is a common ancestor with this particular shared with this particular mat, match. Uh, in addition, we also generate a JETCOM file. So if you have this very large tree, you have get a JETCOM file based on this. So you can load it into um, uh, Ancestry and do some more mining, yeah, do some more tree building, do some more tree analysis. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah, I don't think people realize how powerful that can be. Yeah, it makes it very, otherwise you have to put them in, in, in all by hand. So now yeah, it's- uh, I'm always talking to people about building a floating tree. Oh yeah, yeah. In ancestry, and then hopefully you'll eventually connect the dots. So this yeah. might actually be a way that uh, they can build a floating tree really quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I generate a JetCom file, and so that's nice. Um, another thing that I've implemented, and uh, I should I should worth I should mention. Uh, so this also works if you don't have a tree of yourself. So I visualized uh, myself in this, uh, the the tested person in in, uh, in the green here but it will just treat the tree of yourself as, a, as every other tree. So it doesn't really matter so much. So if you, are, if you are an adoptee and you don't have a tree of yourself, it will make this fantastic graph except this line, but the rest is the same. Uh, and that of course is very handy because um, those true lines, for instance, on Ancestry, did, so they didn't pro provide any information if you didn't have a tree yourself. And this used to work. So that was the most, um, uh, so the best feature as compared to true lines because true lines work only if you have a tree and they didn't if you didn't. So uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So this tree that we're looking at right here, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, the water tool is a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. So this tree is a hypothesis. Very good. It could be. 
and we're coming into that in a couple of slides, but you're right on track. Very good. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I, I said that, so for adoptees, those trees are also excellent because they will really guide you into the right direction. So they work, so they work excellent. But if you do have a tree, so you have a tree linked to your account, it will also tell you which matches are linked to your common ancestors. And this is the um, a short uh, array, uh, short summary. So this is a tree of yourself. And you can see that uh, of your great great grandparents from your mother's side there are already a couple of matches linked to that. Uh, and if you then click on the uh, generations links at the top, you can see more ancestors and you get more information. Uh, so this particular chart shows you which matches are linked to which ancestor of yours and which clusters are uh, responsible for that. Very cool. Uh, this is actually like crew lines, right? This is true lines, but then in a different way of uh, showing it. Yes, this actually is very powerful. Cool. If you click on the lowest one, so that's Phoebe Lee, 1815, 1877. So she is, so there are two clusters. So it's, uh, the matches that are linked to Phoebe are in two clusters, one and two. And there are five matches linked to this particular match. If you click on this particular link, you get now Phoebe as the common ancestor. And all five matches, one, two, three, four, five, that are linked, and yourself, because you are also linked, all five matches that are linked to your to this particular ancestor, which is handy, right? To have this uh, information all um, lined up. All right, I have another stupid question. No, 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 come on. <laughs> the tree that's above, Yeah. is that a tree, like, it, is that a tree that I, let's say it's my tree. Is that a tree that I have manually built in your system or? No, no, so, 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 that was, so, that, so that's the tree that was available, uh, for instance, on Family Tree DNA. If you have uploaded your own ancestors as a tree, it will grab it and it will take this and it will take the information. Okay. So, it, so, this, so, so, so that's all done automatically. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Some time ago, Roberta Estes from DNA Explains, she asked if I could make the same auto tree available for Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Apparently, some people have a lot of DNA matches uh, for Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Actually, I have a lot of mitochondrial DNA matches, even with uh, distance uh, zero. And it might be interesting to do the analysis only for those matches. Uh, so this auto tree really focuses on Y DNA or my mitochondrial DNA uh, trees. So matches that you have on family tree DNA. And this allows you to quickly find a shared common ancestor in the, in the trees. And uh, for sake of um, having a better visualization, the male ancestors are displayed in blue and the, uh, the females are pink. So that allows you to quickly see if the line is continuous, continuously uh, blue or, uh, or, um, or pink. So here we have some um, Y DNA matches. And I can't even see it on the screen here, but I can see here, I think, They've tested with 67 STR markers. And then there is a um, common ancestor here. If you click on that, you will see that um, they have the Bush surname at the lower right. And they, are, they both have the Bush surname. So that seems to be their uh, common ancestor for the Y data. So this is a very quick way to get the data for Y matches. Uh, and it, it actually also compares itself with trees from your autosomal matches. So if you're, if you're really lucky, then you can get a match with your autosomal the matches as well. And then you uh, have a very nice clustering uh, analysis so ahead of, uh, ahead of you. Yeah. Very cool. Let me ask you real quick. Can I do this, any of these tools, with another DNA kit that I manage? Like mm -hmm. I manage like 10 of them. Yeah. So what you do is you... For every kit that you manage, you have a different set of credentials that you log in. So every credential set you supply to our system, and then you get it. So then the system will pull down the profile information of, of that credential uh, set, and then it, there you can start the analysis. Yeah, Fantastic. I had I had people in there uh, back in the days. I think they had like 500 profiles linked to Ancestry or so, and they had difficulties getting the list on the screen because it was such a big list. My, so the systems were not able to get the information on screen. So I had to provide hacks to get the information on there. There's so many profiles. So wow. really a lot. To come back to your original suggestion about the uh, Wado and the, uh, and my auto tree, we actually thought of that as well. And it's, we created auto pedigree. So this is like an automated hypothesis creation, like an automated Wado. Uh, so what are the arts? And this does a 
automated reconstruction how a person, for instance, an adoptee fits into a reconstructed auto tree. So this is a very small tree. Uh, what it actually does it, is it makes the auto tree trees. And then for every common ancestor, it makes uh, fake children, so hypothesis. Uh, and then it will, so it, makes, so it generates those descendants. And then for each of those descendants, it will do a auto check and it will keep track of the results. And after a while, it can rank the results and find out what is the best place where I, where I should be. Because I've also placed in my own tree and it will, if you, if you will put in your own tree, it will ignore that per section, but it, for the visualization purposes, it was, it was still put them in. So, so you see yourself as tested person in green and all of your matches are then also, you have a DNA matches, 102 centimorgan, 135 almost, and it goes on. And you see different hypotheses and the hypotheses have a color badge as well. And the ones that are green are the best. And these even have a rank. So the one that are ranked the first is the best hypothesis. And if you then look, of course, I picked a very nice example. If you then look underneath tested person, you see an hypothesis 29 with child number three, which is ranked the first. And if you look, how is it created? It is it's also in concordance with your own place in the tree. So if I would not know my place in the tree, so I would not know. Um, myself in this tree, uh, this particular rank, so this section would tell me where I would play. So this is more like an, an automated version of the uh, Wardo. And actually Wardo nowadays also has an automated feature built in. So if you go to the second beta version of Wardo, it has this um, feature also built in. You can do an automated. So you put in all, all of those matches and you click a button and it will also tell you which is the best place in the tree. It makes sense, right? It's just doing all kinds of these analysis automatically instead of doing it yourself uh, by making those hypotheses. Not to have a pun here, but what are the odds <laughs> <laughs> that, that this is relatively accurate? Yeah, of course, it really depends on your matches. If you have high centimorgan matches and uh, some good reconstructed trees, it will work very well. Um, if your matches are not that good, and of course, it will reduce the, um, the chance of getting success. You get some big tables underneath which allows you to compare because it all also depends. If your best hypothesis is only a little bit better as the second best, of course, that is not really the, uh, the best scenario. So ideally, you would like to have your best scenario, the best hypothesis, be much better as the one that is uh, underneath or the second best. But this helps you. Uh, and what it also does is it generates uh, Wado files and JetCom files, of course, but you can load the Wado file into Wado online and do some additional calculations. So if you have found it, an error, then you can correct that online and then go from there. And what it also does is because it will also correct if you have multiple genealogical paths to the tester. So sometimes you have matches that are linked using several paths uh, because they just happen to have multiple links to your uh, to yourself, and of course these different paths will inflate the centimorgan score, right? Because if you share a certain set of centimorgans, if you have different lines, uh, that will be much higher as compared to one line. Uh, so it has some adjustments for that as well to con to uh, to compensate. Anyway, that would be really powerful for somebody who's trying to find their biological parents. Yes. Uh, and for sake of uh, um, honesty, I have to mention that this used to work very well, for, quite well for um, matches and uh, trees for ancestry. And for family tree DNA, you have to be a little bit more lucky. Well, yeah, um, you know, because I think ancestry the, uh, still has clearly way more DNA matches or DNA kits out there than anybody. Mm -hmm. And also the quality of the trees, I think, and the number of trees per match is also a little bit higher, I think, as compared to other sites. So that also helps. In the next um, last section of this presentation, I will describe the latest kit in town, which is auto segment, uh, which I just recently um, released, and which is a clustering based on DNA segments. This has been fabulous. I can't wait to get into the next segment. <laughs> I mean, I'm learning so much. Uh, thank you.